Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be the minister with this congregation of people of all ages at all stages of life. I want to tell you a little bit about this beloved community. We live into our mission and we try to do so with embracing joy, enriching connections, encouraging growth, acting out of an abundant sense of love and empowering our ability to dream and to be creators and enactors and relate in relationship with this world. So we celebrate good things whenever we can. We provide opportunities to strengthen relationships and we want to grow as individuals and as a community and as a people and as a global sense of being part of this global community as well. We also take to heart, as you might imagine, our connection with this world. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They were here, they and other nations were here long before the first European settlers came down the Illinois River. We take a moment, as we've been asked to do during service, to recognize the Peoria people for who they were and for who they are today. I also want to offer a moment to welcome folks who are joining us today, whether you are new, whether this is the first time, whether this is a repeat time and you're just like, what is this place and who are these people? And maybe I should get to know them. Thank you for joining us, whether you're in person or online. And I want to invite, uh, if you like to get to know us, help us get to know you a little bit better. We have plenty of name tags. We love all the questions. You can test us on the questions because, you know, come on, give us, give us a challenge. And I want to invite folks to stay after service for coffee and conversation in Fellowship Hall. If you're with us in person, uh, we'll be in Fellowship Hall or stay on the Zoom for a chat there as well. And let me invite you to set your devices to worship mode, whatever that looks like for you in this moment. We have a little bit of instruction this time as well. And I have a couple of notes for today. Uh, I want to thank everybody who was part of our annual Haunted Forest. We had the Haunted Forest that was last night. Uh, in case you are new, we transformed the loop of trails that are just off the sanctuary here into the woods into a larger-than-life haunted experience. And, oh, my gosh, we brought it last night. Can I just say, let's give us a hand to everybody who was a part of that. We love when the weather is really good, too. Thank you to Jesse Lachlan for really coordinating the whole shebang, to Justin McAlexander for the use of an installation of great lights, projector, generator, black plastic curtains that really kind of crafted the trail. We have Keepers of the Great Grove who offered ancestor reflection and sigils and a photo booth. All the people who staffed the trail and scared everybody. Let me tell you, I certainly jumped a few times going through. Regina made me go first to go through the trail. I'm just saying, she made me go first. It's okay. I can do that. Um, she thought the holiness might protect her. I don't think so. Uh, the lot was full. The parking lot was full for much of the night. We had people from around the neighborhood also walk in as well. We could tell. I can't cover everything, but it was just a wow. And I think we took some something north of, what, 1,400? 1,600? Yeah, we took in something north of 1,600. Um, I know, right? And that's admission. We had cocoa and cookies. Thank you to folks who brought and made cookies as well. I mean, it was an experience. Um, and I'm just going to say, you can check out, I mean, it's daylight, so not the spooky, but I invite you to check out the trail, uh, what we have, what's kind of still up and around. Um, check out the trail for yourself today after service. You can get a flavor of what we created last night. And, oh, and you could also help us bring things in so we can put them away. That would be fabulous, too. All right. On Wednesday, we are doing a new thing for this congregation. We are taking part, we've done some two Sundays of writing postcards to get out the vote. Uh, this coming Tuesday evening, we are partnering with UU The Vote to do some phone banking. It's actual calling of people. And I tell you, from 
the structure of it, it's very easy. You're not calling people's numbers. You're dialing into a system that does it for you, and then you can talk to somebody uh, when they answer. So there's lots of ways to be instructed and to be helping with this. Uh, I think Regina Stanley is the person to talk to about that. Again, that's Tuesday, this coming Tuesday evening at church. I want to invite you to check it out. Uh, also, this coming weekend, we just, we can't stop with the Halloween. I'm just saying, you know, other congregations, other churches, for them, December might be the month. October seems to be ours. I'm, I know, nice, right? Nice. Uh, so next Saturday afternoon will be our kind of in-house, our church Halloween event, right, from 1 to 3. Uh, so we'll have that inside in Fellowship Hall. It'll be a lot of fun. Come and check it out. Bring some friends. And Sunday, so that's Saturday afternoon. Sunday afternoon, we're hosting two events at our location. One is a trunk retreat created by a local lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender plus a group of folks. But also inside, we're hosting a youth event for our affirming faith community, congregations, and colleagues. Uh, so that certainly is one to invite friends and family to as well. You can see me for the one that's inside for the affirming faith community. And we'll stop there and let me invite Jeanette Gruber up to say a little bit about our small group. Because it's that time of year as well. Part of how love wins is to have small circles. We call them connection circles now. And it starts October 20th, which is today. And I've been placing calls and leaving texts so that you will know the first meeting you're invited to. Everybody was able to be invited to something that met their needs as they were disclosed on their sheet. So that means we have a chance to meet each other in a little smaller space and notice how wonderful it is to just have a conversation with another you, you check in about how you're feeling, check in about a topic that we discuss that has to do with some aspect of being spiritual. Please come and talk to me if you'd like. I've been working on reaching each of you. Take care. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much, Jeanette. And now let me invite you into our opening hymn, number 12, O Life That Maketh All Things New. Please rise, embody your spirit. <laughs> Thank you. 
Please be seated. Good morning. I really like our reading for today. It backs up all that Jennifer has been saying, and it's uh, very pertinent to our community. It's called Come By Our Fire by Jennifer Kitchen. Come by our fire and let us share stories. Let me hear your tales of far off lands, wanderer, and I will tell you of my travels. Share your experience of the holy with me, worshiper, and I will tell you of that which I find divine. Come and stay, lover of leaving, for ours is no caravan of despair, but of hope. We would hear your stories of grief and sorrow as readily as those of joy and laughter. For there is a time and a place and a hearing for all the stories of this world. Stories are the breath and word of the spirit of life, that power that we name love. Come, for our fire is warm, and we have seats for all. Come again, and yet again. Come, speak to me of what, your, what fills your heart, what engages your mind, what resides in your soul. Come, let us worship together. And I invite the Smezrud family forward for our chalice lighting. The Echo of Inner Wisdom from the Soul Matters team. We light this chalice to remember the light within, to know that the hunger we feel inside is an echo of inner wisdom that wants something more for us, for others, for this weary yet wonderful world. From Laura Yvonne Steinman. Let us listen deeply to what is in our hearts. Let us listen to what our fears are. Let us listen to the young children. Let us listen to the teens. Let us listen to the elders. Let us listen when the world is sick. Let us listen. This moment, you are welcome to come forward during our music for meditation and light a candle to express something that is in your mind or on your heart, give it light and life and form, to remember someone, to cherish someone, to sorrow, all of these can be found in the lighting of our candles. Let us enter into our music for meditation.
from my colleague, the Reverend Susan Manker Seal. Much of ministry is a benediction, a speaking well of each other and the world, a speaking well of what we value, love, honesty, forgiveness, trust. A speaking well of our efforts, a speaking well of our dreams. And through the speaking well of it, this is how we celebrate life, living the benediction, the good word, and becoming as a word, well spoken. In that spirit, this is the time for the sharing of joys and sorrows of the congregation. We offer notes of sorrow for Helen Martin. We offer condolences. She found out her sister Elaine Sow died in Sarasota, Florida on October 8th, just prior to the arrival of Hurricane Milton. There was a certain relief that she had passed before and during the hurricane. We offer our sympathy to Tom and Terry Malone and their family. They had the sudden loss of Tom's brother, Bill Malone, died at age 72 in Springfield earlier this week. We offer condolences and care to Crystal Duggan, someone who's been attending the congregation. She recently found out that her mother died and is deep in that sorrow. And I received a note. We offer our condolences to B.J. Lindsay for the loss of her college friend, Jeff Meyer. He died yesterday on October 19th. Let us also extend a wish for healing and health and well-being. Uh, Kim Farland, Kim Farland wants to let us keep in our hearts her best friend from grade school. She's going in for open heart surgery tomorrow. Her name is Christine Skelton. So let us offer our best wishes for a good surgery and a good recovery to Christine. Let us take one more moment. Let us take one more moment and be together in this time, this one moment we know we share. Let's take one more breath in the shared quiet together and be present in this great circle that can hold us all. Let us enter into this moment and breathe. Shalom, salam, namaste, and blessed be. I invite Jesse Lachlan forward for our story today.
Our story today wonders, what if? Maybe you wanted to do something, but didn't have quite the thing you had in mind and had to find another way. Let's see what happens in this story. What If by Samantha Berger and Mike Corrado. With a pencil and paper, I write and draw art to create many stories that come from my heart. But what if that pencil and paper disappeared? I'd fold it up till stories appeared. And what if that paper was no longer there? Well, I'd chisel the table and carve up the chair. And what if there wasn't a chair here at all? I'd chip and I'd peel at the paint on the wall. But what if there wasn't a wall anymore? I might build a story from the boards in the floor. And without any floor, I could still use the land and sketch out a tale with the dirt in my hand. I could still shape the leaves. I could sculpt the snow. I could plant the flowers and make kingdoms grow. Without any land, I'd invent shadow stories. And if there was no light, I would still use my voice to sing out my stories, to chant, rejoice, I'd still have my body to twist and to bend, to dance out my stories, beginning to end. And if I had nothing, but still had my mind, there would always be stories to seek and to find. If I know nothing, that's quite the story. If I know nothing but one bit of fate, As long as I live, I will always create. As long as I live, I will always create. (laughs) I wonder what you will create today. I invite the kids to join me for religious education. And with the fire drill happening a little later, I could always use extra grown ups today.
All right, so in case you hadn't read the announcements, Jesse gave it away. Yes, there will be a fire drill at the end of the service. I know. But keep in mind, this is one form of good stewardship, right? This is one way of many ways in which we take care of our community and take care of ourselves. And one of the ways we also do that in our time of service, time of worship, is to receive the morning offering. And we do this to remind ourselves of how many gifts we have to offer. We give to remember that we are part of something larger than ourselves. We give because we believe in music and beautiful space. And we give with the faith that together we have enough. In fact, we, we truly have more than enough. It's in that spirit in which we give. And we also know that we can give a little bit out into the world as well. Uh, every month we collect for a local recipient through our Share the Plate uh, program. And we take half of the undesignated uh, contributions from the plate and give them to our local community, a local recipient. And for this month, our recipient is product of the project. And it is a group that is involved with local urban youth designed to help bottle uh, character, relationships, positivity, financial literacy, a healthy life. And it's also very much focused on youth mentoring as well to raise up children who really need an extra bit of boost, some really positive modeling, and some focus and some leadership opportunities as well. So we give to product of the project for this month. I'm going to Thank everybody for your generous uh, givings. If you want to, you can go and designate where you'd like your gift to go on the envelope uh, in the pews and or also go to the QR code in the order of service. And I want to thank everybody for all the gifts that you give to make this congregation and its ministry possible. It is a beautiful work that we do together. And now I um, invite the ushers to please come forward. From Black Social Justice Facilitator Adrian Marie Brown. We are in an imagination battle. Trayvon Martin and Mike Brown and Renisha McBride and so many others are dead because in some white imagination, they were dangerous. Imagination has people thinking they could go from being poor to a millionaire as part of a shared American dream. Imagination turns brown bombers into terrorists and white bombers into mentally ill victims. Imagination gives us borders and gives us superiority 
gives us race as an indicator of ability. I often feel trapped inside someone else's imagination, and I must engage my own imagination to break free. All organizing is science fiction. All organizing is science fiction. We are bending the future together into something we have never experienced. A world where everyone experiences abundance, access, pleasure, human rights, dignity, freedom, transformative justice, peace. We long for this. We believe it is possible. Here is the first reading. The second is from author and scientist Robin Kimmerer in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass. Kimmerer is a Potawatomi native uh, scientist teacher and has a beautiful speaking voice, if I may say. And she says, At the height of the summer, when the days are long and bright, and the thunderers came to soak the ground, the lessons of reciprocity are written clearly in a three sisters' garden. Together, their stems inscribe what looks to me like a blueprint for the world a map of balance and harmony. The corn stands eight feet tall, rippling green ribbons of leaf curl away from the stem in every direction to catch the sun. And no leaf sits directly over the next so that each can gather the light without shading the others. The bean twines around the corn stalk weaving itself between the leaves, never interfering with that work. And in the spaces where the corn leaves are not, buds appear on the vining beans and expand into outstretched leaves and fragrant clusters of flowers, of blossoms. The bean leaves droop and are held hooked close to the stem of the corn, and then spread around the base of the corn and the beans is a carpet of big, broad leaves. Those also intercept the light that falls to the ground amongst the pillars of corn, and their layering spaces and uses the light that comes through, a gift from the sun, so efficient, no waste. And the organic symmetry of forms belongs together. The placement of every leaf, the harmony of the shapes, speak that message. Respect one another. Support one another. Bring your gift to the world and receive the gifts of others. And there will be enough for all. Here ends the readings. I invite you to rise in body or spirit for our hymn number 141, I've Got a New Name. It's in the gray hymnal. Follow along if you'd like.
Please be seated. Let me begin with an invitation. So I'm talking about stories today. I'm asking the big what if. And I want to begin with an invitation to say, what are, what are some of the stories that have moved you? Take a moment and think about this. What stories have moved you? It could be a novel. It could be a short story. It could be an article in Reader's Digest. Yeah, that's okay too. It could be any number of things. What stories have moved you? What stories stick with you? Is there something that's in the past? Or is there something more recent? If something particular comes to mind, I'd love to, I'd love to hear if you have a particular title or an author. That would also be lovely. Anybody? Wizard of Oz. Ooh, nice. The boy from Oz, too, I bet. Yes. Wild Robot, that new movie that just came out. And it's a book. It's a book. There we go. Yes, Katie. Our Missing Hearts. Lovely, lovely. Yes. The Red Queen series, Victoria Avegard. By Victoria Avegard. Yeah. Very good. Yes, Jeanette. When bad things happen to good people, Harold Kushner, a great rabbi. Yes. The Dispossessed by Ursula Le Guin. Yes. Yes, Cindy. Can you say that again? The Lazy Man's Guide to Enlightenment. I think we all can relate to that title. Yes. All right. Thank you. And keep, so I want to invite you, partially why I said, you know, you all were welcome to come into costume this into church this morning if you wanted to, but also keep in mind, bring forth those books and talk about them during service, during um, coffee hour, if you would, please. Because there's a certain cross-pollination, right? There's a certain sharing that happens with great stories. Now, if you've heard me at all, you probably have a sense to realize that I am a fan of science fiction. And I also want to recognize that that doesn't speak to everyone. So you know, we, are, we are broad. So this is, the, this is the Doctor Who stole, just in case you're wondering, because we have to bring that one out. But I know that science fiction doesn't speak to everybody. So we are universalist in our welcoming of stories, in our sources of imagination, in, in our wondering. I welcome all characters and all worlds in this moment. And to let you know, in our house, costume dramas are present and accounted for, and they include Jane Austen as well as Star Trek. Costume dramas. Don't be shy. The core question I find behind our vast and deep desire for storytelling and our capacity and our heritage of it, we have been telling spinning tales for it probably as long as we could perceive the world and wonder is how is how shall we live how shall we conduct ourselves how shall we make meaning in this mortal moment we have you know in fact i was thinking about ursula le guin 20th century white woman author, certainly science fiction is what she is most known for, known for the dispossessed being one of those, but also for her commentary and simply her language. She has an essay, short essay called The Carrier Bag Theory of Fiction. And in that she talks about, she explores like how do we know how do we recognize kind of civilization? So how did we evolve as human beings? And certainly, you know, weapons and tools, that was important. But there is another theory of human development, which is that we started to become human once we 
started to have containers to hold things. That was the beginning of humanity. And because we needed to hold things and keep track of them and pass them along. Um, so that would be food, that would be tools, that could be water, but also so too with stories, with memory, with lessons, with descriptions and meaning. We wanted to carry things and pass them along. So in this way, the first carrier, the first container would be someone who received that from us. I love playing with this idea. So she talks about that the first recipient is that first carrier, whoever we shared something with first, is that first holder. And that's where all things about story really begins. And I love that she says in this essay, because she actually is not a fan of novels. She doesn't really care for novels because usually those feature heroes. She's not interested in heroes. She is interested in the human, in the messy, in the screwing up, in the, fa the frailty and the failings, and the work of how to be human, the messy, mere mortals that we are. I've really enjoyed getting into various kinds of story. You'll see uh, in, my, uh, in my office here, I happen to have one of the mystery series that I used to read as a juvenile mystery series called The Happy Hollisters. Anybody know that one? The Happy Hollisters. It's from like, you know that one? Yeah, so it's from like the, the 50s, I think, or the 40s. But the ones that really stuck with me, kind of I had a small informal concentration in college was in dystopias and utopias. And many of those in the classes I took were about recrafting, kind of imagining what happens when the society is taken to certain extremes. Uh, you might be familiar with Brave New World, right, by Aldous Huxley and its mix of fantastic technology and drugs and the suppression of imagination. You know, a beautiful, colorful society, but also created on keeping people exactly as they think they should be. But I really enjoyed the classes where I was able to read the feminist utopias and dystopias. Um, the kin of Atta are waiting for you. I have a little stack of them that I just pulled from my office. Uh, the kin of Atta are waiting for you. It's kind of a Jungian spiral kind of tale where a man finds himself in community uh, created with connection and respect, and the violence in his heart is healed even as he returns to contribute to the healing of the world and answer for a crime that he committed. And this time of year, I can't go by October without also naming another world creator, which is Ray Bradbury, so a native of Illinois, if you will. And his work, including The October Country, The Martian Chronicles, and of course, Something Wicked This Way Comes. And how his work, and just ex he would take a word and just expand on where the word would take him about his fears and his in own insecurities, and would use that to explore worlds and boundaries. He would use it for connecting, for recognizing how chaos is created, for naming and not ignoring the more disturbing aspects of humanity. And all of these, the wildest science fiction, the most domestic at home telling, all of these are about the human encounter, love and greed and fear, and maybe a bit of creation along the way. I get to dive deep into this with, my, with a study group of colleagues uh, this fall called the Prairie Group. And every year we take a, a theme to focus on and answer some deep diving questions into. And this year, our focus is on speculative 
fiction. And it's not just science and uh, science fiction and fantasy. It is truly about reimagining the world, taking the ideas that are played with and then saying, what shall we do with them? What does that change in us? And how do we bring that out into the world? Asking that question, what if? And the questions are along the lines uh, that we're being asked to engage with is, what do, in what ways does speculative fiction offer guidance or wisdom to the experience and embodiment of creating beloved community? What ways does speculative fiction offer guidance or wisdom to the experience embodiment of creating beloved community? But it doesn't just stop at that question. That would be certainly big. It goes further. In an age of harmful misinformation, how does speculative fiction contribute to our understandings of truth? How does a created story add to our understanding of truth? And the question that I have, my partner and I have been asked to engage with is a little bit longer form, which is speculative fiction consistently interrogates the ways in which human hubris and disconnection from spirit inevitably lead to authoritarianism and exploitation of both humanity and the earth. In the context of this political moment, as escalating global fascism and irreversible climate collapse hurtle towards us, what does speculative fiction offer to us as counsel about how we are to survive the apocalypses of our times? In case you're wondering where I go off for like during the week, sometimes this is what we do. This is what we do. And my colleague and I who are responding to that question about how do we survive apocalyptic times, it's not simply to put it in words. We've had the particular charge of not just putting this into words, but to putting it in a form we can really absorb in more than one way. And I've had the luxury, the chance, it is a privilege, really, that I get to think about these things. And I have to say thank you to the congregation for letting me be able to have the space to think about these things. Because it's not just about the, what we put on paper. It's about how do we find ways to bring this into our thought and consciousness to create these containers, if you will, that are not just books that might live on a shelf, but something that will live and breathe with us. And I had a chance to go to something like that and to think about that when my family, we went to Fort Worth last weekend and were able to go to the Modern Art Museum in Fort Worth and went to an exhibit called, I think, Sunset Connection, if I remember that correctly. And it's creating, these two artists were put this massive art installation, this immersive experience that brought in paneling, wood paneling from like the 70s and the 50s and the 40s and lounge chair kind of space and kitchenware from the 50s with modern 3D printer and embodying a merging of form and mineral and nature. Uh, into this imagination where they were kind of a retro future idea of what could be in the world if the San Francisco area merged with the San Diego area and created this massive metroplex. What would that society look like? And they found massive opportunities for cosmology, for growth, for imagination with the merging of the mineral and the, vit and the, and the vegetable and offering music that 
found that that pointed in that direction. And yet they still were recognizing that even with the most beautiful possibility, we still had to be human and figure it out. We still had to deal with ourselves. So this is some kind of the potential of the gift that we have is look at all that is. And now what are we going to do about it? And recognizing how deep the challenge runs. I found that in a much smaller, kind of a much smaller scale, but actually no less deep to me in the moment uh, when Jesse shared the story, recommended the story for today, the what if story. And here is this girl who is talking about how much she is determined to create. With every fiber of her being, she will always keep going. And that she keeps finding ways to imagine, to tell. Every time she's faced with the absence of another medium, another material, whether the lack of paper or pen or so on, she finds another. It could be the walls, it could be the sky, it could be flowers, it could be your imagination itself. And maybe it's because I've already been in this mode, but I found the story more moving than I expected. The image of this girl, think about it for a moment. I mean, the color, the book was beautifully illustrated, but think about it for a moment. Here is this girl saying, I will take a pen to a chair if I have, this is how I can find my way to create. I will tear wallpaper off the wall if that's how I can speak. It brought out that struggle, that deprivation, that hardship for how we need to say what we know. How other imaginations, how other forces can infiltrate and limit us how our circumstances can beat us down, as Adrienne Marie Brown was talking about. I was reading that, and I didn't, it was like just a few pages, but I didn't want to rush through what is a beautiful, gentle book as well. That is the sign of the most potent stories, is it not? The ones that bring out something deeper and unexpected. That child will not stop, even if she draws in the dirt, even if she looks at the sky, even when she simply dreams. The story is not only what she creates, it came from those who set the stage for that drive. Who taught her? Who was the previous filler of the container that this girl was, who told her a story of yes and wow and I wonder and what if. Adrian Marie Brown talks about how much we are subject to others' imaginations, how that would limit ours, how that would limit those who are marginalized in so many ways, especially those who are black and brown and indigenous. Robin Kimmerer does this in a different direction in the course of her work. She points to also the limits of other imaginations as well as she unpacks her wonder and experience of her work to reclaim beauty and heritage and nature. And she did so from the beginning. If you read her book, whether audio or written, she begins by talking about how she chose to be a scientist because she wanted to know why asters and goldenrod grew well together because they were beautiful. She wanted to know why these two colors of flowers grew together well because they were just stunning to her. And when she brought that question to one of her first science teachers, the science teacher's like, Why do you want to know that about the colors? Like dismissed it out of hand. And yet she kept saying, no, I want to know. And I want to reclaim my native heritage of Potawatomi. I want to 
do all of these things and not be limited by someone else's imagination. What can we do? What can we do to not be so limited? I'm just going to say, in case anybody's wondering about any sermon between now and a few Sundays from now, go vote. Don't be limited by somebody else's imagination. Go vote. Go show up. Go advocate for your agency. Go advocate for the agency of the neighbor you've never met. They you can dream who they might be, right? Go vote. But I love the example from the haunted forest last night. I'll close with this. One of our members, Natasha Green, asked, what if we turn the woods into a haunted forest? What if we turn the woods into a haunted forest in a moment of the pandemic when we couldn't be inside? This was 2020. What if we did something new? And we did. And it was frigid that night, but it was wonderful. And it was a relief to be with the people. And to create something fun and a little scary and a lot of sugar. Oh, yeah. You all donate well, I'm just saying. We created that together. Hundreds of people have been finding their way to this place ever since on that night. Including, maybe more so than I think I've seen in another moment last night, where we truly had people you could see where people were coming from and saw how much people were coming across the street and along the road from this immediate neighborhood to this place. Because somebody asked, what if? Organizing. As Adrian Marie Brown reminds us, organizing is science fiction. It is creating a new world that we have not yet seen, weaving the pieces of a world together into new forms, trying and testing and trying again, and pulling and drawing and dreaming again, as in that book, asking what if. And so I invite you to go forth from this place and take up that opportunity, take up that charge and take up that question, what if? And with that, what shall our next story be? Amen. I invite you to rise by your spirit for our closing hymn number 203, All Creatures Great and Small.
another drill. Woohoo, baby, weren't expecting that. Yes, this is a drill. This is only a test. This is just a test. But it is for those who are online. It is the end of the service. Our worship is ended. May our service begin. Go in peace. And please, this is only a drill. Please exit the building following these instructions. If you have children in the RE area, the staff will have them. I know. Thank you, Tim. Thank Tim is demonstrating the drama of the fire drill. Thank you. All children will use the best exit based on their classroom and gather up in the Up West parking lot. And if you are in the front of the sanctuary, exit out of the supply room side doors, please. If you are in the back of the sanctuary, exit out the right, out the back and up. And we all make our way to the memory garden and labyrinth, in case you're wondering. And I think you got that. And then you can come back in and have coffee.